Good afternoon. Thanks for joining. I'm Kevin McGrew, and I'm the SVP of the Americas for Gigaspaces. I'm coming to you from our, <clears throat> from our New York City office live, and joining me is Andrew Shostead, who's one of our senior technical directors. No. Yes, good afternoon. Today's session is going to be focused on mainframe digital acceleration. We're very pleased to be a silver business partner with IBM, and let's get started. So the agenda for today will be a review of some of the digital acceleration challenges that we see in the marketplace. And then we're gonna go into depth about the digital integration hub and, and uh, in terms of the new architecture that Gartner has proposed in the marketplace. And we'll talk more in depth about what we are doing at Gigaspaces around smart digital integration hub to help uh, people like yourselves to innovate and accelerate what they're trying to do in terms of new digital services on top of their mainframes. We'll have Andrew go through an in-depth discussion on that along with the demonstration, and then we'll do a wrap up at the end. So for those of you not familiar with Gigaspaces, we are one of the pioneers in the in-memory technology space, and we're really driving new initiatives to help our clients to be able to achieve greater dis um, transformation of the digital apps and drive faster acceleration of applications. You'll find that we have done a lot of work across a variety of sectors, especially in financial services, insurance, airlines, logistics, and we give a listing of some of our, uh, of our premier clients on this screen. Um, now let's go into some of the digital acceleration challenges that we see in the marketplace. And clearly for um, IBM clients, you know, the, the mainframe is still very prevalent in the marketplace. And, and you know, in a, in a recent survey that was done by the IBM uh, Institute of Business Value, uh, some of the things that they found was that 71% of organizations are still being powered by the mainframe. And they're seeing a significant number of clients, two times the percentage of organizations at this point are, are looking to modernize their environment on, on the mainframe and move into a hybrid, hybrid cloud environment where they have things on-prem and services in the cloud. And the, the rate of modernization on top of the mainframe um, is, is really happening, happening very quickly. And we're seeing a significant number of organizations, in fact, four out of five is what IBM has said, that are really looking at how do they modernize their existing mainframes in terms of how they adopt a more modernized approach towards, um, towards new cloud-based solutions and digital applications. So when we start looking at the challenges of, of, uh, of digital acceleration on top of the mainframe, there's a number of areas that come to light that typically are part of the discussion. First and foremost is the type of data that we deal with. Um, on the mainframe, we have a number of different data structures from VCM, IMS, DB2, Autobus, and these systems, these data sources are exposed either by KICS transactions, they can be exposed and, uh, by COBOL applications, Autobus Natural. So there's a number of ways that they're being deployed in terms of, of, of application needs. And one of the challenges that we see across many organizations is that it's not easy to find the right technical expertise, the right people to come in to, to really manage and maintain and enhance these systems in terms of finding new COBOL programmers or uh, other types of mainframe technical talent in the marketplace. So that's one of the challenges we see in the market. Clearly, when you speak to clients, um, they're, they're running their core business applications on the mainframe. And you know, they're servicing very large requirements of data, transactions, user security. Um, and you know, these applications are historically have been homegrown, as we have said. Um, they've been in production for 30 to 40 years. Organizations are really running their whole business uh, on these environments. So these are not to be taken lightly by any stretch. And any type of new solutions that are being deployed will be expected to coexist with their, with their mainframe systems of record for at least 10 to 15 years. Now, what are the concerns many organizations tell us when they're looking to uh, build out new digital services on top of the mainframe is they're concerned about the performance impact in terms of MIPS uh, you know, from these digital applications because they're not really certain how many users they'll have. There's a lot of unknown factors. How many users will be coming in uh, the data size today versus tomorrow in terms of uh, the size usage, the MIPS usage, uh, the scalability requirements, all those factors are still under the unknown umbrella, if you will. And last but not least is people are evaluating, you know, different approaches to get past these challenges or to address these challenges. 
So modernization options include the, the ability to gradually decommission the mainframe in terms of going to the cloud. It may include moving data and conversion towards microservices and hosting on the distributed system. And last but not least, it could be a transition of the data and services to a more modern environment uh, while coexisting with the mainframe. So in other words, you're decoupling the system of record that's running in production on the mainframe from the actual digital apps through the introduction of a middleware architecture, if you will. And we'll talk more about that. And Gartner had this quote that they uh, had in their January 2022 uh, Innovation Insight Report, basically stating that application leaders struggle to deliver high throughput, responsive and reliable APIs while minimizing the workload hitting the systems of record. So by extending their API platform with a digital integration hub, they can address these issues and add value by enabling analytics and data integration. So the whole challenge here again is how do you minimize the workload hitting the backend mainframe system of record and really help to accelerate uh, the delivery of these new apps. So I'm sure many of you in the audience are probably nodding your head that you have similar types of experience and concerns relative to what you're doing uh, in terms of new deployment for transformation. So let's next um, go over to the digital integration hub architecture, discuss more of how this has evolved in the marketplace. So Gartner um, came out with their innovation insight report, you know, in the, in the past year. And part of what they were talking about was that when organizations are building out new digital applications, they typically are utilizing a traditional or conventional architecture. So that you have new digital apps that you see on the top end of this graphic and you have your system of record on the bottom. And typically what happens is that people would rely upon an API integration strategy where they're building out for each digital app, multiple points of integration to backend systems of record. And this becomes a coupled architecture. And in, in a coupled architecture, you know, 50 to 70% of the time needed to build out a new digital app is really focused on integrating to the backend data systems. Because when you're integrating to the backend data systems, whether it's DB2, VCM, IMS, Autobus, whatever it may be in the mainframe, as well as other data sources, you need to have people that really understand the data. So you need to have a database administrator. You need to have uh, people that are the API experts in this case. So you're spending a lot of time in building out this level of integration for each and every digital application that you need. So now when it comes time for your second digital app, your third digital app, you're repeating all of this complex uh, pro programming, if you will, from an API perspective. And if you need to make any changes to your data models, uh, to the microservices, they're all tied and coupled to the backend systems of record. So it becomes a very challenging environment. So this is a coupled request-based approach and your digital app in terms of performance is only as good as the slowest backend systems of record that it's being integrated into. So clearly one of the challenges that people face is how do we provide a high availability, high, highly, highly scalable, very, very fast system with low latency to serve the digital applications. So Gartner recognized these challenges and one of the emerging new architectures that they saw happening was that of a digital integration hub, where you still see the systems of record on the bottom, you see the digital apps on top, but now instead of building out a request-based coupled architecture, what's happening is you have this middle layer, if you will, which includes a high performance data store and enables the, the organization to essentially move data from their uh, systems of record, the, the, the highly relevant data into this digital integration hub. So this becomes and presents a, an event-based, uh, an event-driven architecture so that the data is always on, it's always available, has the lowest latency to serve up to meet the digital requirements of your new digital services. And this is really the, the direction that Gartner was saying is the most efficient pathway to reduce the complexity of, of the API models that we've seen in the past. So this is part of what Gartner is looking at. And Gartner, in fact, um, has labeled Gigaspaces as one of the leading out-of-the-box providers of this technology. So now let's get, go over to Andrew and let him go into more depth about this. So Andrew, let me stop sharing and you can share your desktop. Sure thing, Kevin. Thank you. And I think uh, you hit the points there. Uh, it's all about decoupling. 
uh, moving from request-based um, data pulls to, to event-based pushes, uh, but not just moving the data into a, a high-performance data store that uh, can power your, your new mic microservices, your new applications. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about um, you know, how DIH or the Gigaspace of Smart DH in particular uh, can help solve that problem for uh, you know, taking advantage of uh, all that valuable data uh, that uh, both legacy applications um, and even new modern applications are bringing uh, to the table and how you can actually uh, aggregate that in a very high performance centralized uh, hub. Um, as Kevin mentioned, what we want to avoid is the complexity and the one-offs, every project being a one-off, uh, repeated draws for the same data, uh, and the latency that, in, that, um, that introduces into the process, never mind the complexity you know, for your architects uh, and certainly the people that are maintaining those connections, the different applications uh, causing conflicts with others. Um, and eventually, it ends up being this this data cesspool where people don't know who owns the data, uh, how do I control it, where do I get it? Um, and what we want to do with the smart DIH or what we provide is that ability to bring this into uh, a centralized location, uh, exposing that through very easy to access uh, APIs and protocols so that you don't have to have those niche skills to actually deploy these new modern uh, services and applications. And that's what the smart DIH provides. Um, we like to talk logically about the DIH in three layers. So uh, if we look at the ecosystem uh, of legacy applications you see on the bottom, uh, it really can span a number of different resources, different systems of record with different technologies, different data types, disparate data sources, document stores, relational data stores, and even uh, cloud-based new modern uh, stores and lakes. Um, on top of that, the ability to actually stream in data is important. So the Gigaspace's Smart DIH starts off with an integration layer, the ability through pluggable connectors uh, to actually, on an event-driven uh, basis, bring data into the hub um, and also monitor for future uh, changes. Uh, so it's change data capabilities. Uh, we have some built-in Kafka syncs. We have those capabilities in the platform, uh, but also the ability to integrate with your um, your mechanism. So you might already have Kafka. You might already have or want to use something like an IBM um, CDC through uh, their IIDR product. Uh, that capability is all within the integration layer of the smart DIH. And as mentioned, it's not just about moving the data. It's bringing it into a, a centralized high performance data store and what we call our hosting layer. And this is a fully partitioned, what we call our space-based architecture. It's effectively an in-memory data grid uh, that provides very low latency, uh, redundancy, resiliency, uh, and high performance. And we do this in a number of ways, both in memory, but we have hybrid models, what we call data tiering, the ability to separate data uh, based upon business logic uh, between memory and, and on disk, but still in that high performance data store. And then finally, what you're doing with that data is exposing it uh, for use, uh, the ability to actually co-locate uh, and run services and, and APIs and, and um, uh, JDBC connections and, and develop applications that are very fast form on top of the hub, on top of this robust centralized data set. Um, as well, you see the ability to actually do operational reporting. So it's, it has full um, uh, data gateway capabilities, the ability to survey the data, the ability to get access to that data through typical protocols like uh, SQL. So, you know, usually it's a phased approach. Kevin mentioned, you know, a lot of folks are looking to uh, democratize the data, open the data for more use, not necessarily removing the, the mainframe from the story here, but to, to be able to decouple that. And so it, depending upon what your end goals are, uh, you do this in a phase approach. You provide decoupling where the data hub uh, is feeding the data uh, from those systems of record, those legacy systems of record. Um, and then you're able to actually, as your, um, your needs are, are uh, suited towards, uh, modernize those different application backend data stores without actually interrupting any of the innovation that you're doing on the front end because you're decoupled from that. You're still feeding data in, you're decoupling, and at your pace, you're modernizing those different applications, or maybe they're just new application stores that you're, you're introducing to the mix. And then finally, if your goal is full uh, cloud-based or full modernization transfer, uh, again, you can do this in a very logical um, and just non-disruptive uh, way. It really speeds that process 
because you're reducing the complexity of the switch uh, when that happens. If you're looking at um, cloud migration or maybe um, on-premise uh, type hybrid environments, you take the same approach, you decouple, uh, and then you can actually have, and, and notice here, not only the backend systems of record have been um, modernized where you have a, a hybrid approach, but also the ability to have smart replication between your on-prem hub uh, and a cloud-based hub. And now this may be for resource scaling. This may be specifically to open that data to other purposes where you only want a subset of that data replicated in the cloud. Uh, and you can actually have on the top layer applications being serviced with APIs coming from both your on-premise instances as well as cloud-based instances. And then finally, uh, that approach logically fits uh, into a modernization approach where perhaps uh, in eventuality you have everything running uh, in your new environment. So again, the whole, the whole goal here is incremental decoupling uh, and being minimally disruptive. Um, what does this look like from a modernization approach or, or freeing of that data from a mainframe? Uh, we have a couple uh, examples here. Uh, one is the ability to actually just get the data out. And, and we hear a lot of um, our clients talking about, look, we have all this valuable data, the mainframe's not going away, but it has so much value uh, in these digital channels. How can we get that out? We, we have the ability to pull the data out, but where can it go? And where can it be go in a robust platform to be used? Um, in our environment, uh, in the smart DIH, uh, there's a number of ingestion methods, as I mentioned, the ability to actually read in CDC streams, I mentioned uh, IIDR, so you can read in things like vSAM, uh, if we're talking about Autobus, you can take in MQ um, uh, streams, the ability to bulk load, batch load, uh, that capability is there. Finally, uh, once it's brought into that distributed high performance data store uh, inside our grid, the ability to actually deploy those microservices so that you're accelerating not just access to the data, but the actual processing of data to serve up those API needs. Uh, and so you, these new digital applications, for example, can code in the languages that they're used to and don't have to be experts on those backend systems of record like the mainframe. Um, also with this approach, you have the capability of actually migrating. Maybe there's some routines, maybe there's some application logic or even whole applications that you want to move uh, off uh, into a different um, deployment model, you can do that. And then similarly, if you need to call upon mainframe functions, you can do that from the smart DIH as well. It's really all about having that decoupling, but having you know, high performance and serving the business needs. This next example it really highlights uh, the approach of multiple systems of record. And this, is, this can't be minimized here. The ability to actually take what was once uh, monolithic uh, in the mainframe and actually being able to couple this within a centralized location, same CDC stream type event driven data coming to the hub, but now bringing in other systems of record. So maybe you're coupling you know, mainframe with Oracle data, or maybe you have some open source data repositories or custom applications. This can all be brought into the smart DIH and in a very similar way, be aggregated and provide a unified data model to those, those new applications. So this is really a, a key thing about this. It's, it's really taking that workload off your project teams who are building those front end digital applications and actually having a centralized location that's uh, very simple for them to integrate into. Finally, just a, another quick note on the hybrid deployment. Similarly, bringing in multiple systems of record and deploying, but as I mentioned, the ability to actually have multiple hubs. Now, these can be, these can be um, distributed by business logic. Maybe there's certain dom business domains that need to be in different hubs. Perhaps you have an on-prem domain for Smart DIH, and also through um, our One Gateway tool, the ability to actually deploy hybrid and actually have replication of the data between the hubs. Uh, and so you're still getting that event-driven pipeline, but in this case, you can have a filtered basis of that data being served out. Uh, it really provides you that flexibility for always on, scalable, both on-prem, both on the cloud, um, and high performance uh, data services and microservices to those applications. So what I wanna do uh, is talk a little bit about, uh, or just go through a demo and talk a little bit about how this looks uh, in, in a real world scenario. Um, what you see here is, is an architecture of my demo environment. Uh, in the middle, you see the smart DIH. 
And what I'm gonna do is show you the buildup of bringing data into the smart DIH uh, and then leveraging that data uh, through an aggregated unified model. Um, in order to do this, uh, you see in the bottom, I have uh, four different example systems of record uh, that I'm gonna be pulling into the space. Um, and I'm gonna flip over real quick. We've automated some of that ecosystem um, buildup, right? So if I need to show you pulling data into a smart DH, I need to have you know, some data repositories. So I'm gonna be going back a little bit back and forth on that ecosystem enablement. And then we'll see what that means to actually a smart DIH product. Okay, so the Smart DIH product itself uh, has, has its own web-based UI, has the capability of uh, monitoring the data, has the ability to, to query the data, and, and uh, take a approach of maintaining and managing and administering um, the scalability of your system. So what I want to do is, first off, I want to show you more of a batch load process. So I'm going to bring in account data uh, from my SQL database, and I'm going to bring in uh, not a relational data store, but actually a document store coming in from MongoDB. And you'll see how this data actually can be pulled in and I can access it through a unified model. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that process. And while I do, we'll see what, what's going on in the Smart DIH. So I'm basically just deploying my, my connectors um, inside the Smart DIH Ops Manager. I have the ability to manually connect to data sources, monitor services, I can actually analyze the data. Let's take a look and monitor what's going on in the services. So you see here in red, the MySQL connector is being deployed and it will be deployed uh, across the partitions. Um, what I'll, you'll also see a Mongo connector being deployed. And what I want you to note is that I have these co-located services, one for actually pulling data that you see in the little cloud icon and the solid cloud icon are signifying stateful data services. So I, I have two stateful data services, one fully in memory called demo, another one that's cross memory and um, SSD storage or disk storage. Uh, that is what we call our tiered storage model. So effectively, let me drive into the uh, demo microservice and we can see that I have eight partitions deployed. I basically have four partitions with automatic resiliency with a replica for each of those partitions and I can get performance metrics and, and uh, usage statistics on those services. And then finally, if I go back and actually look at what data is being pulled in in that bulk process, I see my, my demo uh, space, I see my tiered space. Let's take a peek and see what we have inside the demo space. And as I mentioned, I pulled in some uh, account data, some customer information. And the point here from the data aspect is to keep it relatively simple uh, so you can keep the picture in, in focus. We've just simply taken document data uh, from, from a document store, pulled it in, converted that, pulled in customer data, converted that, and we actually have a unified view. So if I take a peek, for example, at my customer table, I can actually take a peek and see what's going on with my customer information, uh, but also I can actually go and do a cross query. So I'm gonna actually take a query across both the document store data, uh, as well as the uh, data that is being um, pulled in from the relational database. So here I'm pulling in information from account, from customer, and I'm doing a join based upon account ID uh, and looking up a specific account. So I can go ahead and run that query and I see I get the response of the data across both of those. So that's a beginning glimpse of, the, of a unified data model across disparate data sources. Okay. So if I go back uh, to my um, overview here, the next thing I wanna do is actually show um, a CD stream CDC stream coming in. And our pluggable connector is one that actually will allow us to uh, read in data, but actually read in the DDL information, basically the data description to actually get ready for the data to come in. And then a second uh, ability to actually stream that data and those CDC changes. So let me go ahead and start that process. And again, these are ecosystem changes that I'll automate through my Jenkins pipeline. So I'm installing my stream connectors. Um, and for the sake of the demo, I'm actually gonna do a couple other things. I'll explain them as we go. Um, what's happening here is I'm actually gonna bring in those new services, but I'm also gonna deploy uh, some of the other connectivity items. So we have a, a data gateway capability, as I mentioned, you can connect to the Smart DH through PostgreSQL uh, syntax. Um, and there are some other features that we'll use later in the demo. 
Okay, so what's happened here is I've actually pulled in. I, I actually have my uh, Kafka connector uh, brought in um, and actually more items will come up. And you can see it's relatively fast for these, these new data services to be pulled up and, and brought in. Okay, before I jump into looking at what that data is going to look like in the Smart DIH, I wanna back off a little bit and just take a peek real quick at the connection to the backend system of records. Because as you recall, uh, I'm pulling this data in my example from SQL Server. Um, I wanna actually take a look directly at the SQL Server uh, and see what's inside that. So I have a SQL query tool called dBeaver running. Uh, I'm connected to the Microsoft SQL Server here through a test database. And the point I wanna make here is that it's a very simple model. I, I want you to see that it's not all the data. Uh, in this case here, it's the data that related to loans. Okay, so if I look at my loans table, uh, you'll see that I have five entries with different loan rates for different loan types. Okay, so that's coming from the system of record. I wanna be very clear about that. So if I go back to Gigaspaces and, and take a peek at my space now, I will see that I now have loan information that was brought in and I have the capability to actually look at the data from the loan information. So let's just take a query of what was brought in. And it should be no surprise, it's the entries that came from the SQL server. My point here is to make is that any changes on the backend system of record are also going to be replicated into the Smart DIH. So I'm gonna just take my jumbo loan rate and say, you know, just so you guys can see it's clearly, I'll say it's 45% um, loan rate change. And I'll go ahead and save that to my backend system of record. Now with the CDC stream, of course, we're monitoring for those changes uh, on the SQL server. Uh, and then those will be fed into a stream uh, brought into the Smart DIH. So if I go back to the Smart DIH, I can actually come along and actually run my query and see reflected that data. So it was automatically pushed. So whether that's being pushed from the system of record on-prem to the on-prem Smart DIH, whether it's being pushed to the cloud or whether it's being replicated to the cloud, you'll always have that fresh data because of course those legacy applications are not going away. They're gonna be accessing and changing that data uh, and you want to make sure that you have the most current data and information inside the Smart DIH. Okay, so if I go back to my, my, my uh, explanation here, the next thing I wanna show is actually not just a CDC change, but live streaming of information. So what happens here is I'm actually going to do a Kafka sync uh, on a Kafka topic that will have um, transactional information. So these will be coming in, streaming in. Um, and in that process, I'm gonna be writing those transactions to the Smart DIH. But that's not all I'm gonna do. Um, the, the Smart DH will actually take that information and provide an aggregation. So the Smart DH is not just a, a dumb repository. It's actually a very robust, active processing unit that has the capability of monitoring for new data coming in. And if you're doing things like, um, well, you can do almost anything basically, but in my example, a very simple process is triggered where each new transaction comes in and the account information is aggregated so that we, uh, we have the original data, but we also have our processed version of that data and information being, um, uh, being shown in the Smart DIH. So I'm gonna go ahead and deploy that. Okay, let me, let me just show you that. I just wanna go back real quick beforehand and make sure that you see that I have the ability to actually have that information coming in. So I had my pluggable connector that I deployed, that was the CDC. Uh, I have my Kafka connector, which I'm now going to leverage for the uh, streaming. And one more thing I wanna do, just so you can see that it's actually live, is, is show you that we have active metrics on the Smart TIH. So there's the ability to monitor all the information that's happening. We have you know, some nice graphs and charts in our Ops Manager API, but you can actually tag onto this if you wanna pull it into your operational consoles, you can do that as well. And in my example, I'm using the metrics API uh, to stream that data to a time series database, which is then monitored by our out of the box uh, Grafana dashboards. Uh, so you can use these, you can customize your own. Um, it just shows the ability to actually pull that robust information into your own environment. So you don't have to have multiple interfaces. You can actually bring this into your environment. So I'll go ahead and take a peek. I'm gonna go ahead and look at this uh, Gigaspaces dashboard here. 
uh, should be no surprise. We, we already pulled in account information. We pulled in some customer information. We talked about the CDC information on the loans. Uh, and now I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, I've deployed the connector to listen to Kafka. Now we're actually in my, what would be your environment, uh, I'm actually going to drop some transactions into that stream and we'll see the actual um, smart DH reading those transactions in. So I'm going to deploy 100,000 transactions. They'll actively be coming into the space. Uh, I'll, I'll see my peer refresh here. Uh, I will see data streaming in. And then if I see inside my, inside my uh, Grafana dashboard, I can see those transactions coming in and the activity and IOPS um, that are occurring on the smart DH. I also mentioned that we're actively looking for transactions being written. Uh, so you see the account, account aggregation information uh, being calculated on the fly. And another thing I'm doing is actually I'm converting um, into a relational model the transaction doc as well. So I, can, I have the capability to keep it in its native form and I can still query it against that native form, but I can also do transformation on that data. Uh, so we're, we're transforming those documents into actual, um, in our form, Projo objects, but uh, into relational uh, view of that data. So we can go back and take a peek and see what we have inside the uh, Smart DIH. And we should see all that information coming from the various systems of record. So we have the transactions, transaction docs, account information, that aggregation information, as I mentioned, I'll just do a quick query on that so you can see what that is. So based on account ID, I have you know, the number of transactions that came in, the aggregate, aggregate amount for those transactions. So this was calculated. This was not a data type we pulled in. It's a new data type that was, that was processed uh, and created based upon that incoming data. Okay. So finally, I want to actually go ahead and um, take a look at what this looks like from uh, usage of this information. It's great that we have this integration layer. It's great that we have this automatic processing, um, but what can we do now with this data? And there's a couple of things in it. And I wanna keep it simple because that's the whole point. Um, first off, I wanna show you the ability to view the data inside the smart DIH. So I'll get, just for clarity, I'll get rid of my connection to the backend database because we're now decoupled. Uh, and I'm actually gonna to connect to the smart DIH using this query tool. And what you'll see is that I'm not having to go to each data repository and look up these uh, data elements uh, as individual silos, but actually get a unified model. So if I look at my smart DIH now, it will load. I have my demo space that I've exposed. I'm gonna go ahead and look at my tables. And you see, I have all my different data in one unified model. So let's, let's do a sample query here. I'm gonna go ahead and grab one because I am a typo expert. So let me just see real quick, grab one here. Okay. Again, keeping it simple, uh, so that's clear what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm simply grabbing from two different uh, data sources that came into the DIH. It was account information that came from a relational store and it's transaction doc that was streamed in actively that we just showed while we were watching on the Grafana dashboard, uh, those document types. Uh, I'm joining by account ID and I'm looking up the account users for account number 192. Um, and just to be sure that we're actually not just cheating and actually looking at the transaction doc by 192, I'm looking specifically from account type from the relational model under monthly. Uh, and I can go ahead and run this as a SQL query and I will get the information back um, that's across those multiple uh, data repositories, okay? So that's good from a survey standpoint if you wanna work on queries, if you wanna actually see that unified model. Um, but then from the standpoint of um, exposing that data. Uh, we have uh, a number of protocols and methodologies to access the data. We have APIs in Java, .NET. I just showed you the ability to actually connect through JDBC or ODBC uh, using SQL tools. And then finally, 
to keep a, uh, a low code approach for your end users. Perhaps you have a web developer that simply wants uh, you know, HTTP endpoint to access transactional information in my example. Uh, we can actually do that through a low code service generator. So Gigaspaces offers blueprints uh, to allow for quick deployment of, of endpoints. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually add an endpoint. And for my example, I actually wanna service an endpoint for a web developer. He's created this page. Uh, he wants to see transactions um, and he actually wants to have this endpoint get TXN. So I'll create that for him or he can create it for himself for that matter. He wants it on port 8116. Okay, so new transaction endpoint. And then I need my query. So what's my query going to be? Um, I can go ahead and take uh, a similar approach to you, you know going across the model. And again, I'll I'll save the typos here and grab my my predefined query that you will be able to see. Make some some quick SQL checking. But here I, I went ahead, I was querying the, the tool. I figured out what my query I wanted. Uh, I had the capability of parameterizing and, and reading that information from the query. So here I'm getting the count ID by uh, this parameter dollar sign A, uh, and I can go ahead and deploy this. And so when I hit send and, and start deploying this, what's happening is I'm actually um, doing a build on a microservice itself. I'm taking that parameter, it's embedded in our blueprint it will actually go ahead, compile, and deploy across the distributed space uh, this new microservice, okay? And so while that's building up, what we'll see is once the uh, build happens, we'll actually see it being deployed in the space. And I'll jump over there in a moment. This really just takes a couple of seconds, okay? We can see the service, we can see where it was started. And if I'm quick enough, I can get back and see the active, in red, the active deployment of that uh, new service. Now we're, we're actually deploying it across one partition, but this can be scaled across however many partitions if you need for scalability. Um, so now I actually have deployed that service. I have this endpoint deployed and actually can go back to my application. Um, and we've exposed a little bit of the back end just so we can see what's going on here. I'm actually deploying it uh, at this endpoint, okay? Normally that would be in a backend configuration, but for demo purposes, we expose it. Uh, and actually I can now punch in uh, an account to look up and this will actually make the query uh, against smart DIH. It's not going out to all the different data repositories. It's not request-based pull from the mainframe and pull from SQL and, and pull from my uh, document stores. It's calling one place, the smart DIH through the simpler endpoint and provided that aggregated view across all that data model. So Kevin, I think um, that was a lot really quick, but uh, hopefully that uh, was clear that uh, we're decoupling and, and trying to bring a uh, faster you know, modernization approach to uh, legacy environments, including mainframe. No, that was great. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen a second. So thank you, Andrew. That was really a well done overview in terms of what we do for uh, how the digital integration hub really comes together. So conclusions, next steps. So you know, hopefully you've seen uh, how we can provide your strategy to coexist with the mainframe in terms of building out new digital applications. And again, you know, this slide just really goes through some of the key takeaways, right? And it's, it's how do you improve the user experience, right? So that you have a digital application that they can depend upon that delivers consistent low latency. Um, you know, the, the unified data model that you're able to bring together, that's bringing in the relevant, most uh, important data that needs to be represented and fed into the digital apps. It's not representing everything. It's representing what's the most important data. Again, this is a layered approach that sits on top of your existing systems and mainframe and other environments. You can deploy it within on-prem, in the cloud, a hybrid approach, a multi-cloud, as, as Andrew had mentioned. 
And it's really about you know, providing the high performance distributed approach <clears throat> through the in-memory data grid. And you know, the, the, the aspect of delivering and, and beating your service level agreements, uh, that's always a very critical piece because as a developer, when you're building out your first digital application, then the, the, the demands, as I'm sure all of you have seen, the demand for the second digital app, the third digital app becomes prominent. And you, you know, if you have a big backlog, you know, your, your organization is not going to maintain its competitive edge in terms of how you, you know, meet your consumer's needs for delivering new applications. So the whole aspect of DIH that we're sharing with you today is to really reduce the, the development time that's needed to do all the data integration and data prep and enable the data that you need to be always on so that now your developers can really focus in on the user experience, on the business logic layer that's associated with the application you're building, and they'll be able to deliver much faster in terms of new applications to the marketplace. And regardless of whether you want to use REST or Java.NET SQL, you know, we support all of these modern protocols and you know, really enable you to also decouple the microservices from the back systems of record. So that's tied to the DIH now. So that also helps you to improve microservices management as well as part of the process. So you know, as you're moving forward, if what we've shared with you today is interesting, uh, you know, some of the next steps that we can um, recommend would be a further technical review on your specific digital initiatives. We'll come to the discussion with our technical uh, architects, really drill into what you're trying to do, what your current experience is, your current methodology, and how this may offer you a better solution, better fit for your needs. We'll get into a whiteboarding session around the enterprise architecture aspects of what you're doing today and how this can layer on top of that environment and how you can look to deploy this over a period of time in terms of meeting your requirements. We've shown you a generic demonstration. We're happy to show you something more tailored to your needs, as well as a hands-on technical workshop where after we've gone through a technical assessment, we, we go into a technical workshop where we spin up an instance of our environment on an AWS uh, cloud environment. And we give you the example to have a hands-on experience of really validating the type of functional capabilities that you're looking to achieve and be able to really show you how this will help you to accelerate your, your new digital innovation requirements. So hopefully you found this to be a useful session for your, for your organization today. We'd like to thank everyone who participated. Obviously, I'd like to thank my, my colleague, Andrew, for doing a great job walking through the demonstration. And we look forward to having a further conversation with all of you in the near future. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Have a great day.